Hey, good morning, everyone. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. We're starting chapter 4 this morning. And by the way, our children's church leader, Jana, of course, she wasn't up here singing, and she is normally going to take the kids today to have children's church, but she's home with uh, Lucy. Lucy's not doing well. So, kids, I just need you to hang tight, and then we're going to go have a nice lunch afterwards in the fellowship hall, and you'll really like that, because there's going to be all kinds of goodies for you. But turn to Galatians 4. Now, where are we at now? Well, we're continuing Paul's quest here, okay, with God's people in Galatia to bring them back to being people of grace. Reason why? They were bewitched by the false teacher. They had become people of the law of Moses rather than people of the grace of Christ, now, when we get to verses 1 and 2 here, as we read the text today, verses 1 through 11, when we read the text, um, in the first two verses, okay, Paul's going to give you and I a, a word picture here. He's going to give us an object lesson. He's going to talk about how children back in his day that lived in wealthy homes and they had what were called slaves or tutors or you name it. You could give it, uh, you can call them babysitters, okay? But these were people that were fully responsible for bringing these children up until they became of age, like when they turned, say, 18. Okay, you get the idea. Um, you know, Prince Charles had, you, you go on the internet, and you plug Prince Charles, and he had one from the time he was a little boy. Until he, you know, the, all of the people in England that were royalty had that. And I'm sure that right now, um, William and Kate's little boy and, and the girls, they have tutors and people that are privately training them and, and preening them and so on and so forth. So the first two verses here, he's just given this object lesson and then he's going to start applying it. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this along the way because this is a very interesting passage. All right, so we're going to start there in verse 1, and uh, Paul says here, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he, the child, is master of all. Now what does that mean, the child's master of all? Well, basically he's saying, look, it's the heir. <laughs> He's going to be ruling over all this at the, at the uh, proper time, the time his father indicates. But in a sense, since he's the heir, he's like, in a, in a uh, positional sense, he's the master of all. <laughs> he could tell the, uh, the slave, you know, whatever he wants to, but uh, the father's probably going to tell the slave, don't let him do that. <laughs> There's going to come a time when he can do that. All right, so verse 2 the child is no different from the slave, verse 2, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Okay, so there's the object lesson. You know, I, you probably remember when Princess Diana was still alive. She divorced from, from uh, Prince, Prince Charles, and, um, and then she got, you know, a windfall of income, you know, in the divorce settlement. And then Diana, wisely, she set aside a giant chunk of that, part for Harry and part for uh, William? Yes, okay. And so they couldn't touch it till they were 30 years old or 35, something like that. I can't remember the actual age, but 30 or 35. And William got his first, and then four years later or so, Harry got his. Because they were only like 12 and... Eight when Diana died. So they had to wait a couple decades. But nonetheless, uh, they were very fortunate because the interest that accrued on that money, in those 20 years, they ended up with like 30 to $35 million each. So quite an inheritance. So that's an idea about this idea of being under guardians and stewards till the time appointed by the father. When in Diana's case, it was the time appointed by the mother. Okay, the child's trained by the household slave. One day he'll be mature, be able to handle the riches he's going to inherit. That's verses 1 and 2. Now let's keep reading here. Verses 3 and 4. Now, a lot of times we don't get this, but Paul actually is going to be talking about himself as a Jew and the nation of Israel. 
Sometimes, let me go ahead and jump to that. Sometimes, and I think, yes, I, I underline these places here. Uh, sometimes when we read we, it sounds like he's talking to the Galatians. It sounds like he's talking to you and I. But he's actually going to do that in, in verses 6 and following. Here in verses 3, 4, and 5, he's saying to the Galatian people, even so we Jews, we Jews, even so we Jews, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, okay? There are all kinds of things that in before the Lord Jesus came that the, uh, that the Jews were in bondage to, including, including <laughs> the Old Testament law of Moses. Uh, he says he's comparing it to that, to that uh, tutor, to that slave that's watching over the little child. Israel wasn't ready. Israel wasn't ready for the Messiah. So God put them under the law to keep them in check. Question, did they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament times? No. They didn't have the indwelling of the Spirit. So in order to keep their lives in check, as it were, God put them under the law, put them under a babysitter as a nation, because they were responsible for bringing the Messiah into existence, the seed of Abraham. He's going to come. So, remind yourself that verses 3 through 5 is Paul's talking about Jews. Verses 6 through 11, he's talking about Gentiles. He's going to turn right to the Galatians, okay? So, verse 3, even so, we Jews, when we were in children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. There's it's a word that means like ABCs, the basic principles of the world around you. Not, not good most of the time. But when the fullness of the time had come, when Israel was ready, Okay, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Now notice, this. I, I wonder if Paul's thinking about Isaiah 9 here. God sent forth his son. To us, a child is born, the humanity of Christ. I'm sorry, unto us, a child is born, yes, the humanity of Christ. Unto us, a son is given. See, the child is born. Jesus is human, but the Son is given, and the same thing here, except you reverse it. God sent forth his Son, divine, born of a woman, human, the God-man. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those, to buy them off of the, off of the, out of the slave market, as it were, out of slavery, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So Jewish believers could become, and by the way, I told you this last week, the sons there isn't the, the word for infant son or toddler son, okay? There's different words there for that in Greek. This is the word that's adult son. So <laughs> when we get saved, we not only become children of God, okay, the younger like newborns even, okay? Newborns, and then you grow up spiritually. But sp spiritually, we're also heirs. We are adopted sons and daughters. And so we are, you know, we are adult. It's a Greek word for adult sons and daughters. In other words, we can start living. The Spirit comes into us the moment we get saved. We can start living as adults, spiritual adults. We're not like little kids with a babysitter under the law. And that's the problem. The Galatians were going under the law. They were going back into bondage spiritually. It's like, you have the spirit. Why, do you, why are you doing that? So Paul is saying to the Galatians here in verses 3 through 5, God kept us Jews, okay? God kept us Jews as a nation under the law according to his timetable. It was our babysitter for centuries, but then he sent Christ to he sent Christ to uh, set us free. We were enslaved to the law so we could become adult sons and daughters by faith in Jesus. And as adult sons and daughters were free from the babysitter called the law of Moses that enslaved us. 
Okay, so Paul talks to the believing Jews. There probably weren't a lot of them in Galatia, but he did talk to the believing Jews in the congregation. Okay, now in verses 6 through 11, he's going to turn to uh, the Galatians directly, the Gentile part of the church. And I want you to notice, you'll see it up here. Y'all, yours, you all, those are all plural pronouns, okay, in Greek. Uh, it's like y'all, it's like in Dallas, you know, if you say y'all, okay. And because y'all are sons, okay, and you'll see him underlined, but now notice he doesn't use we. Why? Because he's not talking about Jews. Now he's talking about Gentiles, the Galatians themselves. And because you, and because you, Gentile Galatians, are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, okay, this is back, he's talking to these Gentiles when they were idolaters, when they're worshiping idols, when they're worshiping multiple gods, they're polytheists, they have multiple deities. But indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. Notice he's not talking to Jews now. He's talking to Gentiles that have gotten saved. But, verse 9, now, after you've known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly, that means poverty, like a beggar, poverty stricken, the weak and beggarly elements. Why are you going back to the law of Moses, to which you desire again to be in bondage? By the way, how, how, were, how were they in bondage? Well, they were not only in bondage to the idols, but some of those Gentiles in Galatia were undoubtedly coming into the synagogues. Okay, they were unsaved people. And they said, hey, I'm hearing about your God. I want to know more about him. And they come in there. Well, they're Gentiles. They're idolaters. And at the same time, they're trying to find out about this other God named Jesus. Or in that case, in the synagogue, it would have been, you know, Jehovah or Yahweh. So they're learning. Okay, so now they're, they're hearing about the law. And they actually, before they came to Christ, some of them were actually under the law because they were in the synagogues and they were uh, proselytes. They were people following the God of Israel. And that's why he says, you desire again to be in bondage, you Gentiles. And then he says how they were. You observe days and months. This is the Jewish calendar. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. So Paul's very concerned, and next week he's really going to pour his heart out. And we're going to see that next week. But we're going to focus now on this passage and what this means. Now let me start here with a story. We've got the Bible reading done. Let's start with the story. Have you ever had a Christian friend who was once on fire for God, but at some point in time turned away and has never come back and has just been following the, the things of the flesh and of this world. Well, Jesus said there's different things that get into people's hearts and into their minds. For instance, Jesus said the worries, the worries of this life can do that, cause people to turn away from him. They get all tied up in everything that's happening all around them, and they get out of church, they get out of scripture, they get out of fellowship with other Christians, and things start going down the tubes. People, places, and things become more important than God. The worries of this life. Another time, Jesus said, it's the deceitfulness of riches, just making money, just, just no time. No time for God, no time for his word, no time for people. And they turn away uh, because that becomes more important than serving and glorifying God. How about this other thing? Jesus said other things, other things entering in deceive Christians. Other things. You fill, it, fill in the blank. 
He didn't tell us specifically what other things. He just said other things began to take people away from God and turn people away from God. And of course, like uh, Teresa said earlier, Satan has been studying humans for centuries. He's been studying them for thousands of years, and he's been studying you and, uh, and your family. And he knows what buttons to push. He knows we all have besetting sins, the sin that so easily ensnares us, so easily besets us. And man, he knows what buttons to push and get you all bent out of shape and, and in the flesh. And so anything that Satan can use, see Jesus just said, just fill in the blank, anything that Satan can use to draw you away from honoring God, laziness, bitterness, unforgiveness, lust, just fill in the blank. Uh, there, you could just go on and on. He said, other things entering in, choke the word, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So Satan doesn't care what he has to use to get you and I to bail on God, to get you and I in the flesh, to get us away from walking in the Spirit. His goal is to enslave God's people through false teachers. I just put this up here to kind of give you an idea of a first century home church, okay? And that these teachers could come into these homes, and, you know, you got to realize, other than the synagogues, which weren't bastions of evangelical Christianity, uh, they had services in homes, and if you had a big home, you might be able to get 25 to 50 people in there, but most of the time they were these small tenement dwellings, like in the book of Romans. But nonetheless, uh, they weren't big, and uh, these false teachers would be come in and be very persuasive, especially in an area like Galatia, because they're not near Jerusalem. These people didn't grow up on the Bible. They come in and start teaching them how you need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses or you can't be saved. Big problems. So Satan can use money. He can use all kinds of things to get us off of uh, the road to, with God, but he can also use false teaching, false teaching. He can, you know, listen, I've had to beg people. I'll never forget this one mom who had two teenage daughters. She used to come to our church, sit right back here in the middle, and I begged her that she had come for years. And she came and said, hey, I'm going to be going to another church and I went and checked the doctrinal statement, and it's not good. And I, and I said to this mom, I begged her not to do it, but she wouldn't listen. Oh, they got rock climbing walls, and, you know, they got this and that. And Okay, all right. So anyway, it's, it's a tragedy because now her teachers are going to, or teacher, her, her daughters are going to be listening to teachers that aren't squaring with God's word, and I'm talking about in a serious way. But sometimes people just won't listen. They've got their minds made up, and it's sad. So in our text today, you've got these people that have turned from the truth of grace to the truth of the law, okay? Slavery of legalism. And in our text, Paul asks God's people, you saw it, we read it in verse 9, how could you do this? How could you do this? How could you turn away from Jesus like this? And that's the topic that I want to talk to you about this morning. And I gave the title, When Sons Become Slaves. When Sons Become Slaves. And it's not a good situation. And so we're going to go through this, and then we will go together as a church family. Everybody's welcome to come and have uh, lunch with us, and uh, it's going to be wonderful. So let's bow our heads for prayer, everyone. Father, thank you for... The word of God, Lord, and how it just keeps us on the right path, how it, it corrects us, it rebukes us, it informs us, it teaches us, Lord. Lord, let us behold wondrous things out of your law, and let your spirit do his work in all of our hearts and lives, Lord, so we'll take a stand, and we can teach our children to take a stand against things that aren't right, that aren't biblical, that they'll be trained and they'll know it and they'll be able to see it right away. Well, that's not true. Help us, Lord. And we ask these things in your precious name and for your sake. Amen. Like I said, you know, for the last 40 some years that I've been saved, I've seen how sneaky and deceptive Satan is in ruining 
human lives, not only unbelievers' lives, but uh, believers' lives. And, you know, of course, I told you my story about when I was a teenager and nearly died a couple of times from drug overdoses. I came that close to going to eternal uh, condemnation and eternal damnation. It was very, very uh, uh, gracious of God to let me survive those overdoses. And, and so I've seen the work of Satan in human lives and Christians as well. I've seen Christians get hooked on, on uh, crack and on uh, methamphetamines and just destroy I've seen Christians become thieves at their, um, at their offices and they, they're, they're thrown in jail and they go to jail for year after year after year and they get out and they do it again. Mind-boggling. But you know what, everybody? It happens. And if you don't believe it's possible for a Christian to do that, then what do you do with all the verses where the New Testament's warning people? Don't do this. Don't do this. You know, beware lest anyone plunder you through uh, empty philosophies and empty lies after the tradition of men, after the ABCs of this world and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeah, Christians can be deceived like the Galatians. Paul wasn't trying to get these people saved. He was trying to bring them back to walking by faith to walking with God, to listening to the Spirit who indwelt them, okay? Satan knows there are people that aren't going to fall for, for all of these overtly evil things in the world. So if he can't get them on that end, he'll get a David Koresh to come. <laughs> and he'll get people, unbelievers, to follow him, or Jim Jones, or you name it. There's a gazillion of them, okay? He sends false teachers to deceive people into thinking that Faith alone and Christ alone is not sufficient to obtain eternal life. Or that you get eternal life by grace, but you keep it by works. Or that you must persevere in faith and good works until the very end of your life, or you're not getting in. There's all kinds of little, little uh, sneaky ways Satan does these things with unsafe people and with safe people. And... Uh, if Satan can't destroy you and I through outwardly evil behavior, he's going to try to do something on the inside. Like, for instance, he could get you bitter. And it may not even be seen on the outside, but you're just seething in anger or whatever. It could be something like that, secret, below the surface, uh, false teachers. Okay? He'll get in their minds and they'll start thinking of things like, yes, I, I need Jesus, but I need more. Jesus isn't enough if I'm going to see God one day. Uh, God's not going to accept me unless I do my part. That sounds really good on a human level, but in reality, it's what the Bible calls doctrines of demons. Doctrines of demons. Wow. Teachings of satanic entities. Now, let's do a poll. If I was to give you all several pieces of paper... And I'm going to put it up on the screen with these circles on it. You've seen these before. That was the poll, and you went out to Christian churches, not Buddhist temples, so on and so forth, Muslim mosques. I'm talking about you go to Christian churches around Dallas, and you have all these, and you hand them out to people and say, would you please circle which one of these uh, uh, is the way to have eternal life. Put a circle around what you think is the way that a human being, a person, can have eternal life. Let me ask you all a question. Don't say it out loud, but which circle do you think it would be? Number one? <laughs> number two? Or door number three? <laughs> which one? Okay, if you were thinking, well, probably most people in most Christian churches would say this... You're right. That's what probably most Christian people would say. But survey said, <laughs> okay, it's not number two. It sounds good that I've got to believe in Christ, faith alone and Christ alone. But then when we start somehow, someway saying, yeah, but if you don't, like they were in the, the days of the Bible and in Galatians, unless you keep the, unless you're circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. They added 
to faith alone in Christ alone. So we here at Rich Point, we would say and stand for and promote and shout from the housetops, Christ alone. If you went into some Catholic churches, they, they might say this one, or they might just say this one. If you just live a good life, and God will put you on his scale and everything, you know, your good outweighs your bad. I'm still trying to think, I'm trying to convince myself that there's any humans where the scale would actually tilt in the side, side of good, you know, that it would actually, I, I hope that it would be true. But the majority would cho- choose number two there. It sounds right. Surely we've got to add something of our own. It can't be absolutely free. I know it's the gift of God, but it can't be absolutely free. We're not welfare cases, okay? We're not welfare cases. We should pay our part. Isn't that the thinking that we're born with? You know, we grow up thinking things. There's no free lunch. We're not welfare cases. We should be able to pay our own way. And Okay. That sounds correct to many people, but over and over again, the Bible tells us the opposite. If salvation is by grace, then it is no longer of good works. works. (laughs) Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Okay, this is grace. This is God's favor, absolutely free, the gift of God. That's grace. Now, if you mix works in with that, You take the salt shaker of works and put it in there. It's not grace anymore. It's grace and works. Going back to our last thing, it's Christ plus good works. It's both. But Paul says if you mix works and grace, grace is no longer of grace. But if salvation is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So he says it works both ways. He says says, if it's this... If it's by grace, it's got to be just by grace. Works can't have any part in it. And if it's by works, then God's grace doesn't enter in. You're on your own. You're on your own. And then when you die, God will stick a spiritual thermometer in your mouth, and if it gets hot enough, you're in. If not, and of course, how hot does it have to be? We already told you this a couple of weeks ago. How hot? How many commandments do you have to keep, everybody? (laughs) Every single one. The whole Bible. You can't ever disobey at one time. Because we talked about the chain going across the Grand Canyon. How many links in that chain, if you're climbing, trying to get across, how many links have to break for the whole chain to break? One. So if you have a chain with hundreds of links, only one's got to break, and the chain is broken. And that's the way it is. And that's why it's got to be of grace, because no one could ever live a perfect life. Jesus was the only one that ever lived a perfect life. Okay, so in verses 1 through 5, let's go through this. Paul's comparing a son with a slave. Okay, so you got the the kid growing up in his father's house. He's called an heir because he's going to inherit everything of his father's. Okay? And then you have the overseer. That guy looks like a toughie, doesn't he? (laughs) He looks like he's going to let you have it there. And he's got muscles and everything. Okay, he's a slave or a tutor or an overseer or a babysitter. He's taking care of the the little kid. The father doesn't have time for that in Bible days. That's the way they did things. They hired somebody to do all that teaching. And you're going to learn Greek, and you're going to learn Latin, and you're going to learn all of the great classics. You know, you're going to read and get smart, and, you know, they were training the kid up. So when his father was ready to turn all that over, When they uh, became of majority age, which is, you know, like the father decided when that would be, then he would inherit it all. Okay. He's an heir. That guy over there on the left, the child is an heir. But guess what? Paul said he's no different. As long as he's under the tutor, he's no different from the tutor. Okay? They They are one and the same in a sense because neither of them have any money. Neither of them are rich. Neither of them are wealthy. Okay? There's so many uh, uh, similarities between them. He was an heir. But guess what? Was he enjoying any inheritance? No. Was he enjoying any inheritance? No. I mean, he lived in a nice house and all that, but I'm saying, basically, they both lived in that house. (laughs) So he's uh, an heir, but he hasn't come to the enjoyment of his inheritance yet. And he needed to be set free by becoming an adult. Now, the law did that for Israel. We already talked about that. It was the nation's babysitter until 
Oops, did I miss a slide? Nope, I guess I forgot to put it in there. <laughs> well, let me just go ahead and go there. No, if it's not in there, I'm sorry. I'm going to read it to you, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Okay, Paul's saying, as long as a person is under obligation to obey the Mosaic law of the Old Testament, as long as they're obligated to obey that, in other words, let's just put it this way, as long as you have to obey the Old Testament law to get into heaven, uh, you can never enjoy your spiritual inheritance. Why? Because you're always going to be wondering, did I keep enough of it? Did I keep enough of the law? Okay? You got to keep the law to go to heaven. You got to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, do I do that? Is, you know, does God want me to obey it perfectly? Yes. Does God, you know, how well, how, how well do I have to do it? You can't enjoy being saved. Israel couldn't do that. The Galatians can't do that. Neither can we. We can't enjoy our spiritual inheritance as long as we think we have to put ourselves under the Old Testament law. That was for Israel till the day Jesus died on the cross. It started with Moses on Mount Sinai. It ended when the temple curtain was ripped in two when Jesus died on the cross. That's when the Old Testament law uh, that gave, Moses gave for Israel went away. And I say, well, Pastor Bob, what about the Old Testament itself? All scripture is profitable, but th we don't, that doesn't mean we make it a way of life. You guys probably heard about the guy on the internet that for a year, he said, I'm going to live by everything in the Bible for a year. So he couldn't eat pork sausage anymore. He couldn't eat lobster. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't wear linen and wool. All the laws in the Old Testament you know, and just made me wonder if he was stoning people. <laughs> if he kept that part of it, did you stone people that did thus and such? You know, there's things that people got capital punishment for. But he did it for a year, you know. So he never cut his hair and his beard and everything. And so anyway, he was quite a, he was quite a, a you know, a spectacle by the time he finished. But, but I don't think that he did real well at keeping it. I don't think that he, he even stood a chance, okay? I don't think he was a believer or anything like that. He just decided to do that. But uh, the moment you and I got saved, we were adopted, okay? We were adopted, and the Bible talks about our adoption as sons and daughters. What happens when we're adopted into God's family? Well, we're children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, you know, uh, uh, as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Okay, so when we believe, we become God's children. But this is something different. In my office, I told you I got a little notebook, and I've got 53 things so far. I keep adding to it as I learn more of Scripture. But I've got about 53 things that happen to you and I instantly the moment we're saved. We don't know we're adopted. We don't know we're adult sons and daughters. We don't know all these things. We don't know we're rich in Christ. We have the riches of Christ Jesus, the book of Ephesians, all these things. They're just amazing. We are, the minute we're saved, we're not waiting to become adults. Now, I'm not talking about spiritual maturity. We, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. I'm talking about whether you're going to live under the law as a rule of life, or if you're going to live under the new teachings of the New Testament, the law of Christ, if you're going to, you're going to live under, um, uh, live by the Spirit through God's Word. Is that how you're going to live? Or are you going to put yourself under Moses and say, Moses is my babysitter, and turn away from the Holy Spirit who dwells within you? What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I love the old King James version of uh, 1 Corinthians 6 there. What? <laughs> Doesn't say that in the newer Bibles, but I think it's right on the money. What? Don't you know? Okay. So anyway, but spiritually, we're not just children of God. We're adult sons and daughters. We, be, we obtain that status. The day we're not waiting to get our inheritance, we've got it. The Spirit's indwelling us. We can live through the Spirit. We don't have to wait. So question, why do what the Galatians did and turn and say, no, 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 I've got, to, I've got to put myself under the law. Or, listen, it could be, be modern-day legalism. 
You say, what's that, Pastor Bob? Well, you can go to a church where, the, well, where you'll hear teaching, and they'll just start saying things like, okay, you can't, you can't go swimming with the opposite sex. You, women have to wear pants. Men can't have long hair. And if they have beards or mustaches, they're, they're probably evil. And, you know, they got all these man-made rules, these churches. And ladies, you can't ever cut your hair. So what you do is you let it grow down to your ankles, and then you just start rolling it up. And it's like seven feet tall on top eventually because they don't let them cut their hair. Oh, and by the way, don't wear any jewelry. You can't wear jewelry or makeup. And then also, ladies, you can't wear, uh, let's see, uh, what else was there I was going to bring up? But there's, they, oh, um, oh, you can't wear shoes that have holes where the toes are at. Okay, you have to wear the shoes that are just like Pastor Bob's black ones here that cover my feet. See, I don't want anybody to get tempted by looking at my toes. So, yeah. wow. so anyway, okay. So we get this adult status the day we get saved, even though we don't know it. Paul's telling the Galatian Christians that they are adult sons and daughters who have turned away from who they really are in Christ, and they put themselves under a babysitter. Now listen to this. Saved people under legalism, with all these man-made rules, or the rules of Moses, whether they're man-made or Moses, it doesn't matter. They're not in the Bible. Okay, um, safe people under the babysitter law say something like this, I have to obey, I have to obey, or I may get in trouble, I may not make it into heaven. Now listen to what an adult son and daughter will say. Adult children, they know their status as heirs of God, they're adopted into God's family, they get full adult status. They don't say, I have to obey, they say this, comes from the inside out. Their spirituality is coming from the inside out. Through the Spirit, I want to obey. I want to obey. Jesus is so awesome. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit dwells within me. The Father planned it. The Son purchased it. The, the Spirit, he applies it. And he, and he seals us until the day of redemption. I want to obey because of all that God's done for me in saving me and what he will do for me in eternity. God's great love makes me want to serve him more and more with all of my heart. You see the difference? Instead of having a, a tutor with a whip, stop that! Shh, shh. Okay? I forgot I don't have my, <laughs> my mic. I can't walk around like I used to. Uh, I'm using this mic. Um, Okay, so you get the idea. The, 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 the legalism is like a taskmaster. And yet the spirit, walking in the spirit, is something happening on the inside. Don't you want to do this? Don't you want to honor God? Yes, yes, Lord. Okay, so, so far in verses 1 through 5, Paul shows the Galatians that not only are believing Jews free from the law, but believing Gentiles, verses 6 to 11, they're free as well. They're not waiting to be an heir. They already have it. Okay, let's look real quickly, and we're almost done. The two present blessings of this heirship. We got at least two blessings of being adopted adult sons and daughters into the family with full privileges, okay? We've got two, but guess what? There's going to be tons more in the kingdom of God. When we see Jesus and we, we, we get our full inheritance, oh my goodness, Okay, so number one, and by the way, again, I told you this last week, this inheritance, every Christian gets this inheritance. Just because by virtue of you being adopted into God's family, by virtue of you being a child of God, you get eternal life. You get a eternal dwelling place with God himself. You'll be in his presence forever. You get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian gets that. Now, if you want to get the special inheritance, you want to go up even higher, every Christian gets this much, but if you want to climb and climb and climb and go up, then you can lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. You can get more and more rewards. That's a special inheritance. And the Bible tells us what we do have to do to get those. We'll see it at the end of the book of Galatians. Okay. But... Number one, the indwelling spirit. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. It says that not he's going to, he has done it. Okay, again, these Galatians weren't unbelievers. They were just 
bewitched believers. They were tricked by false teachers. You are sons. You're adult sons and daughters. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, that's uh, Aramaic for father, Father, Father. So get this. You read Romans 8. When we go to God in prayer, this is so awesome. When you kneel down and you cry out, Father in heaven, the Spirit cries out, Father in heaven. He witnesses with our spirit that we're the children of God. A witness goes up from the Holy Spirit in us to God the Father and The Spirit of God is witnessing with our spirit, not to our spirit, with our spirit. And God God the Father takes this testimony of the Holy Spirit and our testimony, and it's just like a combined blessing, okay? So that's the Abba Father. And so the idea there is this respect for our Heavenly Father. That's number one. That's the first blessing of being an heir. Now here's another one. This is awesome. We get in verse 7, freedom from the law to serve God by the power of the Spirit. We get freedom from the law. You know, in the Old Testament, what did Moses tell people? He took the law, threw it down before the people, and he said, do this or you're cursed. Obey this or you're going to be cursed by God. That's not New Testament. That's the law. That was the schoolmaster. That was the the servant, the slave, the tutor that God put on the, on the um, people of Israel to keep them in check. And of course, as you know, it's not, a, it's not anywhere close to being the indwelling spirit because Israel had big problems all the way until Jesus came and afterwards. <laughs> they wouldn't receive him even after many of them rejected Jesus after his death and resurrection. But one of the blessings, one of the things we get from God when we become adult sons and daughters is freedom from the law to serve God by the power of the Spirit. You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Notice that, an heir of God. That's, that's the uh, inheritance for all believers. Romans chapter 8 We can be joint heirs with Jesus. We can get an inheritance like Jesus' inheritance. That's something different. Okay, so Paul's telling Galatian Christians, quit living like slaves, okay? You're not under a babysitter anymore. The Spirit lives in you. He wants to live through you. Verse 9, we read this earlier. How is it that you turn to the weak and poverty-stricken elements of the Mosaic law to which you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. My labor was useless. If you continue on, your, my, my work for you was just useless. I'm going to lose all kinds of rewards in the kingdom because of this. And you're going to lose rewards, Galatians. So Paul's saying, I gave you the truth. Why would you go back to a weak and obsolete obsolete system that even Israel isn't under anymore? Why are you doing that? You're observing the Jewish religious calendar. So Paul told them he was afraid for them. They let false teachers trick them. And they... Rather than living as adult sons and daughters and dwelt by the life-changing spirit, he was afraid for them because if they didn't come back to a lifestyle of grace, they'd live their life in defeat and they would have shame when they stood before Jesus. They're standing there now as believers to get rewarded by Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the bema, the Greek word is the bema, the judgment seat, that we may receive... For the things done in the body, according to which we have done, whether it be good or bad. See, God's going to look at our lives as his children, and he's going to reward us for the good things we did, and we're going to lose reward for the things that we didn't honor him, the ways we didn't honor him. And he was afraid for the Galatians because he said, listen, you're going to stand before Jesus, and you're going to be ashamed of how you lived as his child. Um, Trying to think of the verse. 
First, First John 2.28, little children, abide in Jesus. Stay close to Jesus, that you may have boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Wow, stay close. Don't put yourself under the law. Get in God's word. Stay close to Jesus. Walk in the spirit. Let the spirit empower you. And then you'll stand before Jesus and you'll have boldness. Boldness. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. You're not going to be sitting there. Oh man. Oh man. You know what? You're going you're to go and stand before Jesus and you're going to know that you walked in the spirit, that you did the very best that you could do through God's power. You weren't perfect. Nobody is. But man, what a difference it makes than the Christians that got hung up by the devil and they were like the Galatians and they went off off into false teaching or some other evil, that they're going to be ashamed before Jesus at his coming. Doesn't mean they'll go to hell, but at that judgment, it's going to be a tough time, and he's going to wipe away all tears, okay? They'll eventually wipe their tears away, but at that judgment, right after, you know, uh, I believe, let me think, it's right after the end of the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation, there's going to be the judgment of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, and the judgment seat of Christ, because we're going to go into the kingdom right after that, and we have to get our inheritance, uh, our, our full-bore inheritance at that point. You know, are we going to get the special inheritance? We all have, we'll all be there. Now, who will get that special inheritance? That's what we got to learn before we go into the kingdom. Let me close with the story, and then we're all going to go and have a wonderful... Oh, man, I've seen some of the stuff that's come in. Woo-hoo! Okay. All right. Christian author and pastor David Prince, he shared this story about a family he knew, and no, no eating, Marilyn. Okay, no, no. You can go, but you can't touch. Okay. See, that's legalism. Okay, no, I'm just Okay. All right. Uh, David Prince, he shared this story about a family. I love this story. Okay, so I'm going to put some pictures that I, these aren't real pictures. I just pulled them off the internet, but I'm trying to t help you with the story. A family he knew adopted an older child from an unspeakably horrible orphanage in another country. When they brought her home, one of the things they told her, you know, they said, hey, we're so happy to have you here. Put her in a beautiful bedroom. And they said, you know what? If you can help mom and dad, all we're going to ask you to do is for you to clean your bedroom. Keep your bedroom clean, okay? Would you do that for mom and dad? And so she was expected to clean her new bedroom in here in the United States, beautiful, she couldn't believe it. So she began to do this without fail. She began to do this to perfection. Uh, her room was clean to the hilt every day. Well, one day, her parents came in and they told her, hey, we want to check your room, we want to see that you're taking care of it, keeping everything, uh, everything in its place, putting your toys away, so on and so forth. And when they came in there, she said... To her parents, she said these words. This is this is the, the this is true a true statement the girl made. She said, "My room is clean. Can I stay? Do you still love me?" See the horrors of that orphanage. Even though she was in a new place, it's just like becoming a believer in Jesus. You have a new father. You got God as your father, but she's wondering. And, and she was mistreated in that orphanage. And so they probably, you know, punished her horribly if she didn't measure up in every way. And she's scared. And she's asking her new parents, my room is clean. Can I stay? Do you still love me? And Prince said this, her words broke her new parents' hearts. They realized that she had lived in the orphanage for so long, even in her new home with two parents who loved her to the moon and back, she, shot, she thought that if she didn't please them to the hilt, she might forfeit their love and be kicked out of the family and out of her new home. David Prince said that eventually the girl understood who she truly was in the eyes of her parents, their beloved child, who would never be forsaken and she would never be a visitor desperately trying to retain her place in the family. Once she understood, Prince said, that she was an inseparable part of her new family, even her parents' correction and discipline didn't cause her to question their love for her. She understood what correction and discipline meant and what, that it, what it meant to be in a family 
and what it meant to be loved. All right, well, let's apply this, everybody. How do we take this home? How do we apply this to our lives? Okay, well, first of all, I want to ask all of you that are believers, that are Christians, I want to ask you this. Do you understand the grace of God? Do you understand in the grace of God in salvation? Okay? Now you say, well, Pastor Bob, if I didn't understand it, I wouldn't be saved. Well, that's true, but you know what? The Galatians got tricked. And they just got, got to thinking that, hey, if I don't, I don't obey. If I don't, now, question, should we obey? Sure. But their thinking is, if I don't obey, God's going to forsake me. God's going to boot me out of his family. I'm going to lose my salvation, so on and so forth. No, Jesus comes and he says, I give you eternal life and you will never perish. No one will pluck you out of my hand. Do you understand God's grace? Okay, that's what we have to understand. And let me ask you this too. If you understand God's grace and you're growing in it, how... How is it? Grace is God's favor. Grace is God being merciful to you, giving you what you don't deserve. God's given mercy to you. He's blessing you. He's being so kind to you. The Bible says he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. He's kind. Well, let me ask you this. Are we becoming like the God we believe in? Are we gracious? Are we patient? Are we kind? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. <laughs> law doesn't enter into that. This is from the inside out. So are we becoming people of grace? Or are we, Mike, I'm not, Mike's back there with his arms crossed. I was, wasn't picking you out, Mark. Are you more like the law? Are you like the man, of, the person of Moses? Are you a person of the law and legalist? Wow, look at, look at what that person's wearing today to chair. Ah, look at, look at, look at uh, what they're, you know, and always just, man, just, just really losing it and not being very gracious. Okay, you get the idea. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say to God's people. And then, uh, for anyone that's here today or that's listening to us on the live stream, I wanted to ask you, <laughs> I want to ask you, um, maybe you're listening and you've thought for your entire life, like when we were looking at those three circles, you thought for your entire life that being adopted into God's family and having an eternal home was by living a good life, was by keeping the Ten Commandments was by hoping your good works outweigh your bad. Uh, that's not the gospel of our creator and maker. That's not the gospel of the true and living God. That's a gospel of works. God's gospel is a gospel of grace. And it says, whoever, whoever believes in me, Jesus said, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever takes me at my word, I'm making you a promise. My gift is eternal life. I promise you, I will give to you eternal life. Do you believe me? If you can say, yes, Lord, I believe you, then by God's grace, that gift becomes yours. No strings attached, no signing a contract, no trying to add some good deeds of your own. You recognize God's promise, and you say, that's the most wonderful thing I ever heard. It happened to me behind a welding factory in Chicago when I was in college. You know, it might have happened to you in your own home or at a church somewhere or on the streets, but it's the same for everyone Whoever, forget about what you've done in the past. Whoever, Jesus said, puts faith in me, takes me at my word, believes my promise, has everlasting life, and will not come into condemnation, won't happen, because you've already passed from death into life.
Those are the greatest promises. I love 1 John 2, 25. This is the promise he promised us, eternal life. And you can only have eternal life, not at all by what you do, but simply by faith in Jesus' promise. It's not what we bring to God. It's God bringing to us his gift. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes, everybody. And as you're sitting there thinking, meditating, maybe, Christian, you haven't been as gracious as you had hoped that you would be at this point in your Christian life. And maybe you can think of ways that you can become more like God and less and less like this world. You could take that to the Lord and just say, Spirit of God, this coming week, begin to transform me. Use your word in my life. And then maybe you're here in this building or maybe you're watching us and you've never believed the words of Jesus concerning eternal life. Today is a great day to do it. You know, you're alive. You have an opportunity. Something inside of you is telling you, you know what? That's true. That is God's truth. And so, if you're thinking that you've never been 100% sure that you've been saved, today would be a great day to say, Lord, I believe. I believe in you for the gift of eternal life. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for how you use it to change our lives. Lord, bless the food we're about to go and eat now in the, the fellowship hall, Lord. May our, may our time together as your people just be wonderful. Lord, we just pray for Brother Bill, Lord, who's fighting um, terminal cancer, Lord, and God, we ask that you'll give him extra special grace, Lord. And of course, Lord, we're going to continue to pray that you might just outright heal him, Lord. That would be so wonderful. But Lord, we ask that your hand will rest on us until we come together again, Lord, either this Wednesday night or next Sunday morning, Lord. But God, we just ask that your hand would rest on us and flow through us on the job, at home, in the neighborhood, everywhere we go, that we might be a light to our children, a light to our uh, neighbors, everyone around us. And we pray these things in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.